using pathfinding to move the NPCs. Earlier in this section we looked at how to use Unity and Blender to set up a mesh to use as a nav mesh. A nav mesh defines the legal locations of an avatar in an environment. But by using a nav mesh you have the added benefit that an appropriate script can parse the geometry creating a database of connections between the triangles in the mesh. Using this database a path can be calculated between points on the mesh. To work along with this video open the files game.js, mpchandler.js and mpc.js in the folder start lecture 6 underscore 5. We'll start with the game.js file. In the load environment on load handler we need to search for the nav mesh. We edit the traverse handler. If we find a child with the name navmesh, then we save a reference to it. Because it comes from Blender, which uses Z as up, we need to adjust the geometry. We rotate it in the X axis by pi divided by 2. It's essential when using a navmesh that the actual geometry is in the correct place in the scene. We set the mesh's quaternion to the identity and set its position to the origin. 0, 0, 0. Now the mesh has an identity transformation matrix. In other words, it isn't moved or rotated. So we can see our nav mesh. We set its material as transparent with an opacity of 0.5. A real application would simply set the child.material.visible property to false. It's important that you don't hide the child itself, just the material. If the child is hidden, then clicking with the mouse would not find the intersection of the mouse position and the nav mesh. More about that in a minute. We also, outside the traverse handler, move the nav mesh from the environment group directly to the scene and call the class method init pathfinding, passing the nav mesh we found in the traverse handler. Now we have a nav mesh, it's time to set up pathfinding. The template includes the pathfinding library created by Don McCurdy. Slide up to the init pathfinding method. It's empty at the moment, time to add some code. First we create a new instance of the pathfinding class. Once you have an instance you need to create a database. This establishes how one triangle in a mesh is connected to another. We use the method setZoneData. It takes two parameters the name to use for this zone and the data to use. For the data we use the static method of the pathfinding class create zone. This again takes two parameters a buffer geometry instance and a float value. The float value is how close two similar vertices can be to be considered the same vertex. Buffer geometry can optionally use an index list so vertex can be shared by more than one triangle. To establish connections between triangles we need to find shared edges and this tolerance value is important in building a new geometry that includes these shared edges. Shortly we'll be looking at using the pathfinder to create paths to move our NPCs. For now we'll add a little code that checks if NPC handler has a GLTF property and if it does calls init NPCs. More about that in a moment. Speaking of the NPC handler, to make sure we have an NPC handler instance, add this code to the load method. It takes a reference to the game as a parameter. Once our NPCs are ready, we can start the animation loop, but it will need the NPC handler to initialize this. To make it easy, we add a little helper method to the game class. The NPC handler instance needs update calling in the render event. That's it for the game. Make sure to save your work and move to the NPC handler file. The principal aim of this video is to load and initialize the nav mesh we created earlier on in this section. To load the NPC we created in the last video and to create a path that the NPC walks along by clicking on the nav mesh. It's a good time to review the mouse handling code. The code that will run when the user clicks the mouse over the nav mesh. It's defined in the init mouse handler method. 
Notice we create a raycaster, add a click event to the renderer's DOM element. In this event we convert the click position, which is in window coordinates, that's 0, 0 at the top left, to window.inner width and window.inner height at the bottom right. We want this in normalised device coordinates, that's minus 1, minus 1 at the bottom left and 1, 1 at the top right. The Raycast event handler receives a parameter, E. This contains details about the click event. Client X is the pixel count from the left edge after padding. Understanding the conversion might be easier with an example. Suppose our window is 1000 by 700 pixels and the padding is 0. So Client X at the left edge of the window is 0. Now suppose the user clicks at 25130. To find the normalised device coordinate for the x value, we divide client x 250 by the inner width 1000, getting 0.25. Now we're 0 at the left edge and 1 at the right edge, but we want minus 1 at the left edge and 1 at the right edge. We multiply the value by 2 and that takes us to 0 at the left edge and 2 at the right, which is still not right. But if we subtract 1, we get the full conversion, giving a result of minus 0.5. If the user clicks the left edge, then client x divided by 1000 is 0 divided by 1000, or 0. Multiplying by 2 is still 0, then subtracting 1 gives minus 1. That's what we want. The y-axis is different since mouse coordinates increase going down and normalised device coordinates increase going up. We negate the y value divided by inner height. Now we're in the range minus 1 to 0. Then we multiply by 2 to be in the range minus 2 to 0. And finally we add 1 to be in the range minus 1 to 1. When client y is 0, the top edge, this gives 1 as required. And when client y is inner height, 700 in this example, the bottom edge, we get minus 1. Then we use the Raycaster method set from camera to create the origin and direction for the Raycaster. The Raycaster has a method intersect object that takes a single mesh as the parameter. If an intersection is found then the method returns an array with a length greater than 0. Each element in the array is an intersect object containing several properties, one of which is the intersect point. We pass this to the console for debugging and then call the new path method of the first MPC in the MPC's array property. But before we can use this code we need to create an MPC. Notice in the constructor we call the load method. A simple loader to load a compressed GLB file. Once loaded in the onload event handler we check if the game has created a pathfinder property. If it has, we can call init MPCs directly. If not, then we save a reference to the GLTF asset. Loading's tricky. The environment might finish loading ahead of the SWAT guy we're loading here. So if environment loads first, it creates the pathfinder, and we'll find that the GLTF property of the MPC handler is undefined, and so we must wait for the SWAT guy loader to complete in which case game.pathfinder exists and we call in it NPCs. If the SWAT guy loader completes first, then it doesn't find game.pathfinder, so saves a reference to the GLTF. Now when the environment completes, it calls in it pathfinding, and then finds the NPC handler.gltf does exist, and this time it's the game instance that calls NPC handler in it NPCs. Either way, we need to add some code to this method. To prepare for multiple MPCs, we create an array of GLTF assets. In the next video, we'll be adding to this array, but for this video, we need a single MPC using a single GLTF instance. We create a property of the MPC handler, MPCs. Then we use a for each handler iterating through each GLTF in the GLTF's array. For this it will be a single instance. We create a reference to the GLTF scene as the variable object. Then we traverse the object. 
If we find a mesh, we set its cast shadow property to true. Then we create an options object. This is required by the MPC class. It needs an object, the speed with which it moves when walking, the animations array from the GLTF file, a reference to the game, here defined as the property app, whether to show a debug path, we'll set this to true for this, the zone name used by the pathfinding instance, and a name to use for this NPC. Now we can create a new instance of an NPC. We set its starting position, this must be on the nav mesh. Then we push this instance to the NPC's array. Hide the loading bar, assuming the loading bar loaded property is true. And finally we call that helper method we created earlier, start rendering. OK, if you save your work and use the main index page of the resources to view lecture 6 underscore 5 start, you should see an overhead view of the environment. Clicking on the obvious nav mesh should generate a path. You'll see each section of the path with corners represented by white dots. The NPC will start walking along the path. Once it reaches the final target position, then the NPC will change to the idle animation. Notice when the game loads that the NPC is standing in a T pose. Can you get him to be displaying his idle animation? Pause the video now and give it a try. <laughs>